Gresham College presents Olympism Education by Dr. Jim Parry, University of Leeds. Evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I recognize one or two faces from last time, so either that must have been not an unmitigated disaster or your dedicated learners. Um, an interest in the subject matter. Uh, this is the second. Uh, oh, I should introduce myself, shouldn't I? I'm, I? For those who don't know me, I'm Jim Parry. Um, I was head of the philosophy department at Leeds University until recently, till I retired. Yes. And uh, I'm now uh, teaching philosophy and have a research chair at uh, Charles University in Prague. Yes, very nice. Thank you. Um, here we go then. In the first of uh, these, this series of three lectures, I try to outline the difference between the Olympics and the philosophy of Olympism. And just for those who weren't here last time, <coughs> the Olympics, we all know what the Olympics are, don't we? Two week festival, once every four years. Elite athletes representing their countries, intercommunal competition. An Olympiad, a calendar term, it's just four year period. It goes from the 1st of January, in this case, uh, 2012, through to the 31st of December, 2016. And the Summer Games is celebrated in the first year of that Olympiad and the Winter Games in the third year of that Olympiad. That's the way it goes. So the London Games, not the 30th Games, but Games of the 30th Olympiad. Olympism, though, is a philosophy developed in the first part of the 20th century by the reviver of the modern Olympic Games, Pierre de Coubertin. And his idea was this. Olympism does not just refer to the Olympic Games. That's the most important thing. It's not just the elite athlete. It's everybody. It's not just this short truce period, a uh, couple of weeks, 17 days, but it's the whole of life. It's not just competition and winning. It's the value of participation and cooperation. You can't win unless you've got somebody to cooperate with in participation. And not just sport. Olympism is not just about the sport. This is a really difficult point to get across, um, uh, especially to International Olympic Committee. But anyway, uh, not just sport as an activity, but also as a formative and developmental influence. So there you see, in just a simple statement of Olympism, at the bottom there, you get as a formative and developmental influence Education. It means education. Education and social, social development. So I tried to put forward this idea, um, and, in, and in, uh, as, as brief and simple terms as I can, um, de Coubertin's claim was there are universal moral principles. There are universal values. Now, this is disputed, but anybody who believes in human rights theory accepts that there are... Um, universal values. And de Coubertin thought that sport was universalizable because it's, it's physical activity. You don't even have to learn another language. It's physical activity. We're all, we all play this game or that game or we're all involved in this competition or that competition. It's, it's, it, anybody can take part. It doesn't matter where they live, what their race, nation, culture is at all. And uh, it says that sport is not just uh, frivolous playful social phenomenon. It's a powerful and important social phenomenon. It can help in world development. It can help in international understanding. It can help in the drive towards peaceful, peaceful coexistence. It can help towards social and moral education in schools. So education is in there again. Okay. So what I've tried to do with the Olympic Charter this time around is to look at all the players. So the Olympic movement is anybody and everybody who has an interest in or uh, is a stakeholder in uh, the Olympic Games and associated um, activities. And, and who are these guys? Well, um, uh, the general statement about the Olympic movement on page 13 of the Olympic Charter, the first thing that said, says is the goal of the Olympic movement, this is the first sentence, right? What's the goal of the Olympic movement? Well, building a peaceful and better world, how? By educating youth through sport. By educating youth through sport. Sport as a means of education and social development. 
practiced in accordance with Olympism and its values. Sport practiced in accordance with Olympism and its values. So that's the general... What's the Olympic movement about? Putting on a road show every four years, or every two years, um, you know, if, if you want to go to cold places as well. Um, is, is, is it about, is it about you know, a two-yearly road show? No, it's not. It's about contributing to a better world through sport. That's an incredibly ambitious uh, aim. Um, here we've got what it says about the IOC. Again, this is the first sentence of the section in the Olympic Charter, which sets out the mission of the IOC and all other associated bodies. The first sentence on the IOC says, the mission of the IOC is what? Organize the games every four years? No, it's to promote Olympism. That's the mission of the IOC. The mission is to promote Olympism, the philosophy of Olympism, not to promote football or athletics or make money or anything like that. Right? Its mission is to promote Olympism throughout the world and to lead the Olympic movement. That's the IOC. The international federations, international sport federations, it should be called. They call them IFs. It should be ISFs, I think. But anyway, um, uh, the first two things it says about international sport federation is that they're responsible for sport. Well, that's obvious enough. We'll give them that. So the first section says um, uh, uh, their main role is to regulate sport worldwide. And the second section says their role is to develop sport worldwide. Okay? And then the third thing, the third non-obvious thing, the first non-obvious thing it says is third, right? Contribute to the achievement of the goals set out in the Olympic Charter. All international federations, as their third aim, and the first non-directly sporting aim, is the spread of Olympism and Olympic education. Every international federation has that written in as part of its uh, uh, rationale. I'm just trying to illustrate that in the official documents of the International Olympic Committee and the official documents of the international federations and the official documents of just about every other body that has to do with the, uh, uh, with, uh, the Olympic Games uh, emphasizes not just the sport, but this huge aim, this massive social enterprise of trying to make the world better through sport. I mean, it sounds a bit daft when you see some of the stuff you see on the telly, right? But this is the idea. This is the idea, trying to make the world a better place uh, by spreading Olympism and Olympic education. So now then, the official rhetoric, as we've illustrated, is it pains to emphasize, but to prioritize as well, the ethical and educational basis of the Olympic movement. It exhorts all responsible authorities to take practical steps to realize the vision and mission of the IOC, which is to promote Olympism. Our question tonight is, how successful has London 2012 been in developing Olympic education in the UK over the past four years? So, <clears throat> let's say. Um, and that's a very sort of uh, direct and narrow, narrowly focused question. And I want to get there at the end, uh, to try and get there in 35 minutes' time and to leave some uh, opportunity for discussion. Um, uh, just to say a few words about um, sport and competition and education. Because remember, it's making the world a better place through... Uh, uh, competitive sport. Um, so um, that was one of last time's slides, just to refresh our memory about the concept of sport. I say the kind of sport I'm thinking of is defined in terms of physicality, contest, being rule governed, being institutionalized, and having shared values and commitments. But de Coubertin distinguished two kinds of sport. He distinguished between world championship sport and Olympic sport. Now, this is really strange, isn't it? Because most people's conception of the Olympic Games is that it's the ultimate world championships. Eh? But de Coubertin denied that very strongly and very often. He said, you've got your world championships in all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, you've got FIFA World Cup. In fact, FIFA doesn't send its best players to the Olympic Games, right? It keeps its best players for the FIFA World Cup and it sends the under-23s. And a few old guys, you know, your Beckhams and your Skulls might get a look in. They're over 23, you know, but you don't get the best team sent there. I think on that ground, they should kick football out of the Olympics. They should send their best people or they shouldn't be allowed in. But anyway, that's another question, isn't it? Uh, uh, de Coubertin 
And this, this, this illustrates why de Coubertin was against World Championship sport. Why don't they send their best people to the Olympics? Answer, because they want the money themselves. They want to keep for themselves the golden egg. They want to uh, keep power in their own organisations um, and uh, uh, they wouldn't have that if they gave it away to, uh, uh, to, to Olympic sport. So, uh, de Coubertin says, the problem with uh, world championship sport is it is simply about the sport. And the problem with that is that it will become commercialised. De Coubertin saw this. Uh, it will become instrumentalised. Uh, people will engage in world championship sport with only winning as their end. Nothing wrong with winning. If you're interested in competitive sport, you're in it to win it. Right? But if you are single-mindedly interested in winning, there's a temptation that you're going to do naughty things to achieve it. Now, you won't do that with Olympic sport, uh, says de Coubertin, because you're in it because it's great. <laughs> You're in, you're, in, you're in Olympic sport, Olympic style sport, because you love sport and you love sporting competition and you love to engage and uh, um, you, you uh, strive after the internal values of the sport. Um, you know, broken down old footballers like me find it really difficult to go on to another sport when, when you're too old to, to, to really play, play football. I tried squash and golf and a few other things. And nothing's like football. Well, of course that's true, because the rule structure of football yields certain internal values. You can only get football-style thrills from football. You can't get them from golf. You can only get golf-type thrills from golf, right? So each sport has internal values, and that's what we're after. That's why we love the sports that we love, because we like exercising and appreciating the internal values of the sport. Now, that's what Olympic sport's all about. And de Cuba now put it in this way. He said, look, you can have fair or temple. I think fair is just a bad translation. Um, he meant, uh, in ancient times, the agora, and in modern times, the marketplace. So the fair as kind of place where you uh, buy and sell. Fair against temple, ideals, um, principles, values. Right? Um, and he said, look, you can have your sport when it's like a marketplace. You know, you can, you can have people getting paid to win and... Um, uh, and even getting paid to lose. Um, uh, people can make their livings out of it, uh, um, and so on. It's not a problem. You can have that if you want. It's not a problem at all. But you can't at the same time have pure sport. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute about amateurism, because that's part of what uh, de Coubertin meant. He, 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 was, he was advocating amateur sport, and I think there's a bit of a problem there. But you can see the point. He's saying, look, these world championships, they're just about the sport, they're just about the winning. Um, uh, international sports federations, they're about profit-making and, um, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, that's okay. Let them get on with it. But we're not interested in that, because we want the kind of sport that's going to be morally educative. We want the kind of sport that's going to contribute to world development. What kind of sport is that? People say, uh, you know, in, in my day, it was McEnroe. What a role model for the school kids. You know, McEnroe um, uh, giving the uh, umpire a, a hard time. Um, you cannot be serious, all this stuff. You know, what a terrible role model. You know, and these footballers, you know, drunken footballers. You know, footballers who, who can't handle life after football and, and end up alcoholic or football, uh, rugby players who get drunk and smash hotels up, or uh, footballers who uh, are in court for, um, uh, you know, because they're so used to having everything they want uh, 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 and, and, uh, and everybody being under their, under their sway. Um, you know, sexual abuse, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 charges. Professional footballers involved in sexual abuse allegations. It's terrible. Yes, this is... <laughs> de Coubertin said... <laughs> This is what's going to happen. If you make a fair, if you make a marketplace out of your sport, if it's part of commerce and business, that's what you're going to get. Don't, don't, don't think you're not going to get that. So you've got to do something to ensure that you have temple instead of fair, and you can't have it both ways. That's what de Coubertin said. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, what kind of sport, what kind of competition is ethical competition. What kind of competition is that kind that's going to do good in the world? Um, here are some examples. Uh, 
moral panics about sports dope. Um, <clears throat> why? I mean, people say it's harmful. You know, people say it's not natural. People say it's illegal. Um, uh, uh, these things are false. Sports dope's not harmful. It might kill the odd athlete, you know, uh, here and there, a few cyclists, you know, the odd Italian footballer. Um, it might kill the odd, I mean, I think the first person after Tommy Simpson to die of sports dope uh, was a bouncer in Norwich who was stacking four or five different things in his liver burst, age 24. Um, but uh, uh, it's not, it's, it's, sports dope's not harmful. Tobacco's harmful. We know that. 150,000 deaths this year from tobacco. Alcohol's harmful, 150,000 deaths too from alcohol this year. So 300,000 deaths from alcohol and tobacco. Who cares? Nobody cares about that. It's not a moral panic about booze. Oh, it's kicking off a bit now because kids are making a fuss in the middle of town and being rowdy, right? But there's nobody saying ban alcohol. Nobody's saying send people to prison for smoking. Nobody's saying that. They're saying ban sports dope, send people to prison for doing sports dope. Now, my line goes something like, uh, there is a panic about sports dope actually, but it's not this. It's not on the grounds of harm. The problem is that the sports dope problem became medicalized. And that ensures that it will never be solved. Because the sports dope problem is not a medical problem, it's an ethical problem problem. The only person who can take sports dope is a person who doesn't mind um, abusing the thing he says he values. Right? A person who takes sports dope and looks another athlete in the eye and says, I've prepared without dope, but he's prepared with dope. He's a liar and a cheat to his friends. And he's abusing the contest that gives him the very chance of success. He's undermining the ethical and logical basis of the activity he says he values. It's contradictory behavior. It's pathological behavior. This is a moral problem. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not a medical problem. So the point is this. The problem of sports dope should be ethicized. The, and the Olympic Games is precisely the kind of motivation we need to ethicize the problems of sport so that they can be oriented towards educational solutions. Medicalize it, and what do you do? You just perpetuate it. I, I was at the 1999 conference in Lausanne that instituted WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association. I was uh, working under Paul Schmidt, um, on the ethics and education theme, theme three. And I met a bloke from uh, <coughs> a university in the city of London that shall remain nameless. Uh, and, and I said, oh, you're from London? He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing here then? He said, I'm trying to get two and a half million quid. And uh, I said, well, what's that for? He said, EPO, uh, we, we did a, uh, they, they gave us a million quid and we did a test for EPO and it was 92% effective, he said. And they said 8% was actionable, legally actionable. It wasn't any good. We need to get it up to 95 or 96%. And uh, he said, we can do that, but it'll cost two and a half million. So he said, I think they'll give it to us. So he was there for his two and a half million quid. Now, this, this, this is a person who advises athletes. And this is a person who teaches uh, pharmacology and sports studies. Right? Now look at the roles that this person enjoys. Right? He advises athletes, presumably on what to take and what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. He's probably designing dope for people and he's advising people on how to detect the dope he's designed. Right? That, that's like a win-win-win, win-win-win-win-win situation. Right? And how, how will you ever be in a situation where you'll catch people when people are so tied into benefits from the system because it's been scientized and medicalized, right? And so long as we treat it as a scientific problem uh, and a medical problem, it will never be solved. Oh, too fast.
Gambling. Jacques Rogge said last year, gambling is the new doping. This is the big new threat to sport. Um, the greatest th threat to, to modern sport, says, uh, says Jacques Rock. Um, if so, it's a scandal that Matt Letissier wasn't uh, prosecuted. Um, three Pakistani cricketers were prosecuted and, and, and received bans, long bans, but Matt Letissier admitted to spot fixing, attempted spot fixing, he was unsuccessful, in a Southampton game, and the police didn't prosecute. Um, but there's a twofold wrong here in spot fixing through your sport. Uh, one wrong is uh, gambling fraud. Now, gambling fraud is actionable. Gambling fraud is illegal. It's criminal. You can get done for it, you'll get sent to prison. But sporting fraud isn't. Because there's two frauds going on. He's, he's trying to spot fix his match so that he can defraud his bookie. Right? That's one kind of fraud. But while he's doing that, he's altering the conditions of the contest, so he's defrauding the other people that he's playing against. Now, if you want my view, which you don't, um, the sporting fraud is the more serious problem here. I, I don't give a darn about gambling fraud. If you, if you can get one across your bookie, go ahead. You know, I'm not gonna, I don't care much about that. But I do care about sporting fraud. And I'm astonished that there hasn't been more calumny heaped on the head of Letitia for doing what he did. His defence is, oh yes, but I only kicked it out of touch on a certain minute so that I could win £30,000. Okay? But he doesn't know whether that act might have had consequences that could have le led to a, a, a lost game for his side. Oh, it's highly unlikely. Oh, highly, highly unlikely. But it could happen. Right? So again, um, uh, what's wrong with uh, sports fraud of this kind? Gambling fraud, that's also sports fraud. It defrauds other people of the benefits of victories that they've been denied. That's the first thing. And I'm, I'm not, by benefits, I'm not just talking about, um, I, did, I came third in this race, so I'm not getting sponsorship. That's a huge thing for a young athlete. Okay? And if somebody gets your place because of dope, that's dreadful, isn't it? You know, so, so, so you're um, uh, defrauding somebody else of, of whatever benefits there are. Not just the money that you might get, but the other kinds of benefits that you might get. You know, personal motivation and so on and so on. But it also, as we've already said, it reneges on the uh, contract to contest. The contract to contest says that you're going to play honourably according to the rules that are mutually agreed before we start. Right? Once you step over that white line, you implicitly agree to abide by those rules and to do your best to ensure that there's a fair contest so that a winner can be established. If the contest's not fair, if somebody's cheating, you can't establish a winner, really. You haven't really won. Right? So you've got to sustain the integrity of the contest. And that's the second thing that goes wrong. You're not sustaining the integrity of the contest. You're, you're enaging on the contract to contest. And this threatens, uh, it sounds so dramatic, you know, it threatens the very existence of sport. It does. That's what's serious about it. I stopped watching cricket after the Hansi Kronje affair. Uh, I, I never really played much cricket, I wasn't very good. But I really like cricket as a game. And I used to watch test matches and stuff on the TV regularly. Um, and after the Hansi, Hansi Kronje affair, I, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself to watch it anymore. You know, you're you all the time saying to yourself, well, is this real? Is it really happening? Or, you know, is it just a sham? Is it just a fraud? Are you just guys going through the motions and just getting some money on the side? Is that what it's about? And, and once you lose public confidence, and once you lose the trust of your opponents, you haven't got sport anymore. So that's the big danger of, uh, of, of gambling in sport. And again, it's an ethical danger. This is the point. It's an ethical danger. And you need an ethical approach to sport in order to cope with it. Um, <coughs> so it's not just any old uh, competitive sport that the Kubernetes was talking about. It's ethical competitive sport. Which means we have to look at the, ethic, the whole ethical basis of sport again. 
um, participating and competing, not necessarily for material gain, but for intrinsic values and satisfactions. You know, I think Tevez is back. You know, I, I, Tevez is a great player. I mean, what he did for West Ham and what he's done for Man City and the goals he's scored in the games he's played and the enthusiasm with which he plays, you know, and uh, the 100% effort and uh, working for 90 minutes. I'd love to have that bloke on my team. How can he not play for six months? What's going through his mind? And uh, it's got to be something like, they say he's lost, you know, nine or ten million pounds through this affair with Man City. Um, and the suspicion is he's coming back because he, he doesn't want to lose any more money, right? But, but, but how can a, a person like that, who you think holds these values about sport, he's earning lots and lots and lots of money, but that's not what it's all about. Do you think Ryan Giggs is still playing because he wants the money? It, it, it doesn't make sense, does it? He, he's still playing because he loves the game and, uh, and he still wants uh, to keep getting the... Uh, 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 the benefit from uh, the internal values of the sport. That's what it's all about. You would think you couldn't do that for 20-something years unless you really loved it, um, or unless you really, really loved money, I guess. Um, so it's participation and, co and competition, not for material gain, but for the intrinsic values and the intrinsic satisfactions. And after all, that's what 98% of sports participation is all about. We sometimes forget that elite competitive sport, very well rewarded elite competitive sport, is a tiny fraction of sport. Majority of sport that takes place in this country uh, in any particular week is of people who are committed to sporting activity because of the internal values that it yields. And that's the thing that needs to be preserved. That's the thing that needs to be preserved from the intrusions of elite um, a professional sport, which threatens it. So if we go back to De Coubertin, it's the marketplace that's threatening the values of sport. And there's nothing idealistic about this. It's not that, you know, we've got to be super idealistic, super moral, super nice people to do, you know, to behave morally. It's not like that. It's a precondition of playing at all. It's a logical requirement. You know, you can't play that kind of sport unless you commit yourself to those values. Now, this is going to come through in a minute because this is why it's a fantastic educational tool. When you've got five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids playing a game or engaged in some competitive physical activity, you can't talk to them about the political values of modern liberalism and... Uh, um, universal fundamental ethical principles and human rights theory and stuff like that, but they can play a game. And they can get to understand what it is to play a game. No, you can't do that. I've got to do it this way. Johnny, I've told you three times, you'll have to leave the pitch if you do it. So, with, with the smallest of kids can, en can learn to engage in a game. Now, the point is that it's that learning to engage in that activity um, that brings with it morally educative benefits because they can't even do it unless they're behaving in the right way and then when they get a bit older they can understand the explanations for that you can start you know offering explanations of why you do this and why you don't do that I remember when I was 11 years of age and I was playing in one of my first uh, representative games for Trent Valley boys I'm from Derby and the Trent Valley runs between Derby and Nottingham and uh, I played for the Trent Valley boys and uh, for the f it was the first time I'd ever done anything like this uh, um, somebody, somebody was hacking me, and it, he did it three or four times. And, and this one time, um, he had three or four kicks at me. I turned around and kicked him. I got sent off. And uh, I just turned around and kicked him. And a guy spoke to me afterwards about it. And he didn't say to me, that's stupid getting sent off. Um, you know, uh, we might have lost. We won, actually. We might have lost just because of you. It wasn't like that. He spoke to me about the values of the, of the game. And he said, it doesn't matter what they do. Uh, let the referee sort him out. He says, you've got to be brave. You've got to be tough. It's a tough game. It's a game for brave people. Get in where it hurts. Somebody hurt you, so people get hurt all the time to learn how to put up with it. That's part of it, you know, um, uh, being able to support that kind of uh, physical pressure and uh, physical threat and, 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 and so on. That's part of what it's all about. He said to me, he said to me, when you get older, you'll get bigger people 
nastier people trying to do worse things to you. And if you can't handle it, you won't be able to play. Now, uh, I'm not saying that what he said to me was right, but what he was doing was engaging me in some kind of understanding of what it is to play and some kind of understanding of what good behaviour is in those circumstances. Now, that's the morally educative potential of ethical sport. That's the idea. Just a word on amateurism. Uh, uh, I think we kind of got this wrong in the 20th century. Um, we kind of thought, um, uh, you know, it meant that, uh, the British anyway got it wrong. We kind of thought it meant that anybody who worked for a living in a certain field was thereby disqualified from amateur competition against people who didn't do that for a living. So people who worked on the River Thames as boatmen, for example, couldn't row in the Henley Regatta because it wasn't fair. You know, they were workers on the water. Um, these, uh, rowing was a sport for people who didn't row. Yeah. How st what a strange idea that is, right? In the same way, in 1861, when the uh, three A's was uh, established, all previous records were expunged. Whatever kind of records there were of uh, running feats, Peter Radford wrote, uh, you know, the 400-meter uh, sprinter, um, professor of physiology at Glasgow, retired now, uh, great guy, Peter. Peter wrote a great article about, uh, about athletic records uh, in the 19th century. And the idea was that he thought that he, he thought somebody ran a four-minute mile in 1748. He th there's decent evidence that the four-minute mile was first run in 1748. And he said Roger Bannister got the credit for it. Um, and uh, uh, he said the reason why these, uh, um, these great feats uh, go unrecognized is because they were the results of pedestrianism. Pedestrianism was... Um, uh, foot racing, uh, walking or running, or long distance feats performed by servants usually for their masters. And they were therefore professionals. They were running errands all the time. Sometimes they'd have to go 20 miles. Sometimes they'd have to walk from uh, York to Dover was, 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 was one example of, uh, you know, guys just walking and, and so on. And people put bets on them. And there were some tremendous physical feats, forgotten. Uh, in the midst of history, and a lot of them deliberately expunged in 1861 because running records were for gentlemen who didn't actually run. Right? That's what made it sport for them. Right? Now, uh, de Coubertin's idea was something different. Um, it's, it's not a question of whether you're getting paid for it. That's not the, the most important thing. The most important thing is that if you do have extrinsic goals, and if the extrinsic goals are, become so important this is one of the big problems of nationalism at the Olympic Games and medals tables. Uh, de Coubertin was against this. De Coubertin said it's not about countries, it's about individuals from all around the world competing against each other. The gold medal is for the individual, not for his country. And the IOC refuses to publish medals tables. But all the newspapers publish it because everybody wants, you know, everybody wants to see, they think everybody wants to see it, right? Now, de Coubertin thought, look, this is an extrinsic goal. It's a nationalistic, external goal, a goal that's external to the actual sporting contest. He said, well, what we're really interested in is a sporting contest. And anything that's an external influence is a potentially corrupting influence. That includes commerce, money, um, uh, fame, uh, prestige, um, career, all these things that might motivate somebody to, um, uh, def uh, to, to become deflected from the ethical trajectory, which is necessary for pure sport, for Olympic sport. So the idea is, if we play sport in pursuit of its intrinsic goods, we're less likely to stain our quest with questionable means into which external goods might tempt us. But this is not just a sporting problem. You know, people, people, only, uh, people seem to think that this is a pe peculiarly sporting uh, dilemma, but it's not. It's a problem right throughout life. This is another lesson to be learned too. Uh, whatever lessons you're going to uh, you're going to learn through playing sport, they'll apply to the rest of your life as well. That was another of de Coubertin's thoughts. And here you go. It's true. Athletes might be corrupted into doping and diving and fouling uh, in their desperate attempt to win prizes and other external uh, goods and recognition. But so do businessmen. Uh, 
businessmen too might be tempted away from ethical business practice and into corrupt means to maximise their profits or to save their businesses. Um, something tells me that's what's happening at Rangers at the moment. It's very strange that a large fraction of the money required is owed by the chairman to one of his own companies. A bit strange, isn't it? And you, you know, the suspicion comes to your mind. I wonder if the manipulations at Rangers at the minute have got anything to do with his making a profit. If so, questionable business practices. How did, what's his name, who used to run Chelsea Bates, how did he get hold of Leeds United for a penny? How do you do that? How, do, how does Leeds United go into receivership and Bates ends up running the thing again? How does that happen? So, so uh, part of the idea is, you know, ethical business practice. I mean, uh, some of you may be in business. Um, I, I used to have a little business myself. Um, and w when you're pursuing your business interests, uh, I, I anyway, I, I didn't want anybody to think I was cheating them. I didn't want anybody to think that I was enriching myself by, by doing something unethical to another person. I, I, that's not business for me. Business for me is when you do something for somebody and they pay you something that they think it's worth it because you've given them a service or you've given them something that they think is worth the price. And everybody's happy and, and you make a profit. What's wrong with that? You know, that's, that's how business should be, isn't it? And, 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 and you know, fly-by-night um, uh, plumbers uh, you know, go bust once every 18 months um, with huge debts and, and so on, and, and, and they've got bank accounts all over the... We, we think they're strange guys, don't we? I mean, there's not somebody I'd like to go out for a drink with. Right? There's something wrong with that way of conducting yourself. It's not proper business. Well... This is um, uh, a question about not what is proper business, but a question about what is proper sport. Uh, finally, 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 before I get started, a word on education. Um, one idea of education is um, uh, giving people information about or giving people instruction in some specific things. Sometimes people think giving advice about for example, giving advice on anti-doping. These two, these first two conceptions of education permeate IOC documents. If you look at the report of the 2009 Olympic Congress, uh, there's a report, there's, a, there's a, a couple of pages reporting on, on, on matters educational. The word education is used seven or eight times, and it's always giving information about or giving instruction and telling people what to do, telling people that something is the case, or giving people advice, telling people what to do again. It doesn't count as education for me. That's, that's not education. If, if you think you can educate your child by telling them things, <laughs> you, know, uh, you, you just can't do it. A more general idea of education sees it as a development of personal attributes and qualities of, of, of human beings. And you can't do that with a bit of information. You can only do that in a living environment that teaches them how to live well. So, um, uh, whereas some people think that Olympic education is simply giving people information about the Olympic movement, about the structure of the movement and so on, and perhaps telling them what the ideals are, quoting from the Olympic Charter, for example, um, but there are some of us who believe that Olympism could, could, could make a major additional impact to the school curriculum on a much broader front. Uh, try and get to that in a minute. Possibilities for action. What can we do about it then? If, 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 we, if, we're, if we're interested in ethical sport and we think ethical sport can be educative, what are we going to do about it? Some possibilities for action. Well, the easiest thing to do is to nick other people's ideas. I, I you know, thoroughly recommend this. Um, Sydney 2000, they were the first one to get a really good website. It's an excellent website. Uh, I haven't been on it for the past couple of months, but uh, when I went on the website before Christmas, um, it was still there. And it's a really good website. It's got lots of information, resources, ideas for teachers, suggestions as to what to do, how you can incorporate Olympic themes into your, t into your curriculum and so on and so on. It's really good. And since then, everybody's had one. Uh, we've got one. It's called Get Set. If you want to Google Get Set, it'll take you to the uh, LOCOG uh, website and you'll see the educational uh, uh, resources and programs that are on the Get Set website for us. So that's okay. Athens 2004. 
they changed the nat national curriculum, right? They enacted new laws in Parliament. They um, uh, appointed 3,000 new and extra teachers of physical education. They were there to teach uh, more PE because they put, put more PE onto the curriculum, but they were also there to deliver an Olympic education, um, uh, additional Olympic education curriculum, which was to do with the values of Olympism. Um, stunning initiative. Um, eventually uh, nosedived. But, you know, Greece, is, Greece has 10 millions, the UK has 60 millions. Six times three, that's 18,000 pro rata, 18,000 PE teachers Britain would have to appoint to do what the Greeks did. Can you imagine what physical education in school would be like if we had 18,000 new phys ed teachers? What you could do, you know, on the ground with 18,000 new people. What you could do for sport. You know, what you could do for sport education, what you could do for kids. You know, uh, you know, do you share my view that kids spend too long in the classroom? Uh, it's not just sport, you know, it's the arts and it's, it's any practical or cultural pursuit. It's, it's sidelined, marginalised in schools. It's all, it's all three R's and official knowledge and uh, working up to GCSEs. And it's inadequate as, uh, uh, as an education for children. Um, uh, all the good private schools know this. All the good private schools know this. Uh, why, is it, why isn't it good enough for public school, for, for, for um, uh, state schools? Um, I'd have daily PE, I would. Um, but that's another thing. Beijing. They completely re uh, revised the moral education curriculum. They had three uh, major focus, focal points for the new moral education curriculum. They used the Olympics and um, um, uh, the development of modern sport within China which is, which is going a pace now. The, the participation rates in, in, in modern sport forms in China is absolutely fantastic. Um, to cope with this, they've, um, uh, uh, they've used the motivational force of the input of sport into the school curriculum to redesign the whole moral ed education cu curriculum with sport as one of the three pillars. Right. So, you know, the idea, can you imagine in England that, well, first of all, that we had a decent uh, moral education plan, which we don't, right? Uh, but secondly, that sport would be leading this. And thirdly, that there would be a curriculum review that would implement it. It's just unimaginable that this would happen uh, in England, something like this. Um, and yet, um, they did it in uh, Beijing, and you can imagine how many children that, uh, that affected. The IOC uh, also has a project called the OVEP project, which is Olympic Values and Education Project. It's, uh, it's a set of materials that are customizable for any country. It's a kind of generic set of Olympic education materials um, produced by a woman called Diana Binder. Um, and they're freely available for everybody. So, so look, if, if you wanted to do something, you could just copy some of this or use some of this stuff, couldn't you? You could do that. Um, we did a website, Get Set. We didn't talk to anybody about the national curriculum, no interaction with the, uh, with the DfE or um, physical education bodies or um, uh, 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 PE teachers or uh, lecturers in higher ed, nothing like that. Uh, we didn't think about moral education in the curriculum. As far as I can see, um, there's nothing uh, uh, been done towards values education uh, uh, through to 2012. Or, there are other things you could do. You could look at what we used to do. In the past, in Great Britain, we used to have a National Olympic Academy. Now, I haven't got time to explain what a National Olympic Academy does, but you get the idea to have a National Academy where people who are interested in Olympic issues, Olympic matters in higher education, and teachers in schools can get together once a year, twice a year, maybe have regional meetings and so on and so on, support each other, motivate each other, share materials and ideas, try and get things going in schools. They closed it down in 2009 on the run-up to 2012. We do not now have a National Olympic Academy. One thing you could have done is just, is just keep the Olympic Academy going, right? No, nose dived. An education committee, the British Olympic Association used to have an education subcommittee. Uh, I'm a proud former member of that in 1985-86. People who were on that committee, I mean, some of you may know the names, Peter McIntosh, you know, uh, stunningly bright, uh, and uh, effective physical education 
uh, physical educationist over many, many, many years. Uh, Jim Biddle, um, uh, a PE inspector whose, uh, whose son, Stuart Biddle, is now head of the department at Loughborough. Um, I mean, I could go on. I mean, just stellar people. Um, doesn't exist anymore, the Education Committee. I mean, the British Olympic Association has a dozen committees. Committee for this, that, and the other. They don't have an Education Committee. Why not? The, the, their mission is supposed to be promoting Olympism and Olympic education. They don't even have an Education Committee. No advisory group. Okay. They could engage with the PE profession and the PE curriculum, the national curriculum. Uh, in the 80s, uh, at the British Olympic Association, we did this. We had good relationships with the Physical Education Association and we, we made joint representations to parliamentary committees and made recommendations on the new national curriculum um, that was brought in. Um, no engagement at all at the moment now with the PE profession. Uh, Olympic Education for 2012 has gone ahead without any consultation with PE, with PE professionals. Um, no work with the department. You might want to develop an Olympic study and research network. We tried to do this in the 1990s. We had a lot of meetings. Peter Radford, incidentally, was at, was at one of them. We had people from Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales, and different regions in England, about 12 of us met, tried to develop, uh, in conjunction with the British Olympic Association, an Olympic study and research network. Where's that today? No, we don't have one. We have an Olympic study center at Loughborough, which was supposed to do some of this work. Uh, that Olympic Studies Centre has ended up being a lecture programme and there have been no lectures for the past couple of years and uh, it's provided no activities at all for British people in 2012. Uh, it's actually got one uh, activity that I, that I can discover for 2012 and that's to have a bingo round about the Olympic Games time for all the other Olympic uh, um, study centres around the world. There's one in Seoul, there's one in, uh, in Canada, there are six or seven around the world and they, they're, they're going to have a meeting for all those people. Uh, but, uh, but th there are no events scheduled for Brits. Uh, connections with culture. One of the big things for Dakuba Town was sport and other elements in culture. Right? But let's make these connections. Right? We've had a cultural Olympiad. I've been involved in... T it's, it's been tremendously well organised over a four-year period with lots of resources and eight national regions. I've been involved working with two of those regions, the Northwest Cultural Conservatory and Observatory, which is Manchester, Liverpool. I've done a bit of work with them and a splendid person over there, Beatriz Garcia, who's running a fantastic people over there. Uh, but they're, they're, they've run a fantastic cultural program uh, in, in over four years, well-funded and uh, producing fantastic uh, events and so on. Nothing to do with sport. Nobody ever mentions the Olympic Games. So for them, the, the Olympic aspect of it is simply the Olympiad. It's a calendar term. They happen to be doing whatever it is they want to do, which they would have probably been doing anyway if they could get funding for it. But they've got extra funding for it. They've gone ahead and done their own program. Nothing at all to do with the Olympics. Nothing at all to do with, to do with sport. I've been involved with the Yorkshire one. Um, there's one project called iMove. And this project has been visual art, um, dance, and various uh, other kinds of uh, performance art. And uh, it's, it's been associated with a series of, of, of lectures and discussion groups and so on. It's been, it's been very, very good. And it has taken, I move, it has taken human movement as, as, as the basis of its, uh, uh, of, of its events. It's the only one I know of. So Beatriz Garcia has to do a a study of all the uh, uh, um, uh, cultural regions and what they've been doing uh, for, the, uh, for the Cultural Olympiad. And, and I'm dying to see what that reveals. But my um, suspicion is that it'll reveal that the culture vultures took the money and ran. They did what they wanted. They made no attempt, really, to connect with sport. And yet, uh, we've had a Cultural Olympiad. Where was the Educational Olympiad? Where were the Regional Educational Consortia? Um, uh, where was the big push towards developing educational initiatives through sport in schools and in, uh, uh, in uh, sporting organisations? You know, little clubs around the place where most of the work gets done anyway uh, on a voluntary basis. Nothing there. All right? How much money has been spent on Olympic ceremonies? That's part of culture as well. You've got ceremonies, culture and education together. Uh, wasn't a couple of weeks ago the government announced an extra 45 million for the... Uh, uh, for the uh, ceremony. I'm not against that. Uh, the, the rationale was this is going to be the longest and best advert for Britain that we'll ever get. Right? It's worth 45 million extra. 
oh, that's on top of the other 45 million and on top of, I think, of 25 million before. So you're looking at 110 million, something like that. 1% of that would have made a huge difference in the provision of Olympic education in Great Britain. 1% of that. Was it forthcoming? I doubt it. I don't know because I can't find out. But here's my suspicion. If you look at the ratio of funding, Olympic ceremonies, cultural Olympiad, Olympic education, it goes lots, lots, nothing. That's, that's, that's what I think is going to come out of it. So, um, uh, oh gosh, I've gone on it. Very quickly then. There's a structural issue here uh, with LOCOG and the BOA. The British Olympic Association is the National Olympic Committee. And there's a temptation when you've got LOCOG around, when you've got the Olympic Games, there's a, temp there's, a, there's, a, there's a temptation to say, oh, it's all LOCOG's responsibility now. Because LOCOG is supposed to have a responsibility to provide Olympic education during the Olympic period, right? Um, so there's a big tempt, and the BOA's got a lot to do. They haven't got many staff, and they've got a lot of things to do. So there's a big temptation to drop the ball for a bit and say, it's all right, let LOCOG do it. But the big question is then, what, what when LOCOG goes home? LOCOG goes home in September. Who picks up the ball again then? Who, who is it who's going to, uh, if there are any in initiatives, who's going to run with those initiatives for the next 10, 20, 30 years? We've got a website. Great. Um, uh, already well-motivated teachers will use it. Um, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of people dipping into it and a lot of people using its resources and so on. But it's not Olympic education for the teachers, is it? Where are the training programs? Where are the regional discussions? Where, where's the extra training for, for teachers and so on? We don't have it. Podium, that's supposed to be the outfit for further and higher education. It's a website. They, they, don't, they have no activity. That, that's not a criticism of Podium. They weren't set up to, to activate. They were set up to collect activity and, re, and represent it and reflect it on the website. But all I'm saying is, it's not, it's not doing any Olympic education. Okay? Uh, Inspire, the Inspire program, I got a badge. Uh, I was speaking at one of these uh, iMove things, and I got a, an inspired by uh, um, uh, London 2012. So I got an Inspire badge. And Inspire is a great idea. It's, it gets a lot of people involved um, pretty cheaply, pretty easily. It, it, it garners lots of activity and, 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 and brands it as you're part of the thing, you're part of Inspire. I think it's a great thing. I, it's nice for me to feel part of it, right? But, but, but it's a cheap win, isn't it? Because right? you haven't done much, really. You've just given me a little badge and said, you're, you're one of us now. Right? You've not actually engaged in a whole bunch of Olympic education. Take the volunteers. 80,000 volunteers, Sebco spoke to them. Um, they've got comedians showing them around and all sorts. It sounds like a marvellous do. Being a volunteer is a fantastic thing. Um, uh, I volunteered in uh, Athens and they didn't take me. My mate, Kostas Mundakis, he was a volunteer in Athens. I went to Athens and he was a volunteer there. And he was just a marvellous inside view of the whole thing. You know, and just to be part of it and to have a little uniform and say, I was there, I did my bit. Absolutely marvellous. But again, it's a great opportunity for Olympic education. The briefings that they're getting, these guys, I wonder if they're getting any Olympic education as part of their briefing. Maybe two words on values or something at the beginning. The rest of it will be how you do your job. Right? It'll, be, it'll, be, um, it'll be employment role briefings. Right? Huge opportunity to hit 80,000 people. Has that opportunity been taken? Don't know. Olympic Study Centre at Loughborough, which is actually co-administered by the BOA, very little activity. Very, very, very disappointing. So, legacy. What's this going to leave behind? What's 2012 going to leave behind? Legacy, for me, is a code word for urban infrastructural change. Um, Barcelona. The city now faces the sea. It used not to face the sea. Big change. Massive change for Barcelona. What a fantastic city it's become now. It's a great city before. It's a fantastic city now. Uh, uh, Athens, would you ever have got a decent road onto the Peloponnesos from Athens, from, from the new airport? Never. You would never have got that road. And it benefits all Athenians. Every Athenian will talk to you about that road. Um, and it, 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 other, other sorts of infrastructure that Athens would never have got. Um, paying for it now, aren't they? Uh, but but th th that's what legacy means for most people, right? Now, sports legacy often uh, means sort of the same thing. It's, it's, it's code for the sports infrastructure, you know, what you're left with. In the case of Athens, at least six massive sports facilities that don't get used. Right. 
Um, uh, big thing for us is no white elephants. Let's leave a legacy of this um, sports infrastructure. Great thing if we can get it, right? Sometimes, only sometimes, sports legacy means increased sports participation. Um, uh, that's not working. Um, sports participation figures have gone down year on year, um, 2008 to 2012. So if, so if that's an aim, it's not been very well pursued, has it? Um, but, but none of that, for me, is legacy. Maybe sports participation, increase, that, maybe that's a bit. Legacy, legacy for me, uh, that's not an Olympic legacy. You can have urban infrastructure change without the Olympics, although the Olympics might help with that. You can have a sports legacy without the Olympics, right? So what's Olympic about it? Only that it happened at the time of the Olympics. So what is an Olympic legacy? I think it would mean reconceptualizing and revitalizing PE in schools, re-engineering the role of PE in sport in schools and communities, reconsidering the role of PE sport and the other practical and cultural pursuits in the life of a pupil, refocusing, re-theorizing possibilities for moral education. None of this has been done. I have not read one word on this stuff in the last four years, and I've looked very carefully for it, okay? Nothing. So, Olympism and PE teachers. I'm just focusing on PE teachers just for a last moment. What's the point of all this? You know, and I, I think these three things are helpful. The PE teacher is one of those in school who has a concern for the whole child. Um, and you can work at the levels of activity and ideas, like I said before. You can get them involved in activity without yet explaining the ideas to them, but the ideas are there inscribed in the activity. Secondly, coherence between approaches to practical and theoretical work. Uh, it, it's terrible when there's a division between practice and theory. But the whole point about an Olympic approach to this is you work out in practice on the sports field things that, you've been t that, that you can understand theoretically. And that works then from upper years to lower years. There's a kind of coherence through the curriculum because you work at a practical level here and you gradually move towards a more theoretical level as the kids get older. So I would commend uh, an adequate conception of Olympic education to all teachers, but especially to physical education teachers. And I'm very, very disappointed that um, we've not made m more of the um, uh, opportunity we've had over the past few years to do something about this. Um, I think that it's uh, uh, very, very disappointing. It's a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity spanned as regards Olympic education. Thank you. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.